So we are recording. Hey. Hey, what's happening? Mm, a lot of shit. My brother just texted me today. Uh, he listened, started listening to the conversation we did um, last time around. Mm -hmm. And he found it funny that like the, the, the very beginning of that conversation is you saying, you know, hey, from crazy America to you in crazy Russia, I think America is even crazier right now than Russia. And right after we taped that conversation, um, what happened is Navalny, the guy who was poisoned by the secret services, went into a coma in Siberia, then went to Germany, I was transported to Germany to get better. Uh, it, by the way, that, you know, we have this like psychedelic aspect to these conversations. There are some psychedelic experiences that he reported as he was getting out of the coma that I wow. found interesting. But so he, you know, has, have, had been in, in Germany now for what, a couple of months now. And he just arrived in Russia after we taped that conversation where he claimed that America is crazier than Russia, uh, then Navalny arrives, gets arrested right there at the airport, even before they got like, like his passport doesn't have the stamp that he entered Russia. They interject before that happened. Brought him to the police station. In the morning, uh, he was woken up and um, invited to like, you know, outside of his cell. And to his surprise, he found himself at what they claimed to be a courtroom. This has never happened before, so I've, as far as I understand in Russia, I've never seen anything like that, where like you're supposed to get from the police station to an actual courtroom, and then there's a trial. They moved the court to the police station to speed it all up and to make sure that no extra people are present, like as, as, little, as few journalists as possible. So then they put him in jail for 30 days, but it turns out the guy had a little bit of a plan uh, for that kind of uh, course of events. And as he's in jail with no means of communication, his team is releasing uh, this like almost two hour video, um, this like expose of Putin's what they call palace. There's this huge territory uh, and a bunch of buildings, and one of them is like palace-looking building. And they've made this is not really news. Like there have been reports about this thing. There's this secret building, but these guys managed to get blueprints of the place with all the furniture listed, and they contacted the furniture makers to get like photos of the furniture, and they got some photos of the place. So they ended up hiring somebody to produce a 3D visualization of the place and they show all of the rooms that Putin has in his palace, which include a theater, two story theater, uh, a place to smoke hookah with a stripper pole. Uh, there's something that's called, <laughs> there's something that's called mud room, like a room for mud. Um, Maybe a mud wrestling. It's next to like spa activities, so maybe something oh. like you. But it's pretty, you know. It's it's there's a difference between knowing there's you know he has a palace, whatever he has a big building, and then looking at these things. And it's one thing that strikes me every time when I see these kinds of like places that dictators tend to build for themselves is it's never tasteful. It's always just <laughs> like if I if I if I found myself in that place wandering through from one room to another, I would assume this is a bad dream that I'm stuck in some kind of a, a distressful hallucination. But apparently, for him, this is like if you have all the resources uh, you can have, what are you gonna do with them? I'm gonna build myself this. And there are, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to throw one more thing. Okay. Uh, people, people have been joking about this now for, for a few days. One of the uh, turns there is with all this money, this is like 
incredible amounts of money spent on this thing, they still couldn't get it right. And the place got attacked by mold and they have to, they're redoing a bunch of stuff there because um, it wasn't done properly. Somebody made a joke that this is, like, it's good to know that mushrooms are on our side. The mold is attacking Putin. No, that is no good. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> well, first so of all, this is just, just to finish the the, sure. the update. So that video now, maybe I can check it right now, how many views it has. Last time I checked, so it's been like two days that it's out. It has 46 million views. Holy cow. Okay, so people are watching it all across the world then, not the, just in Russia. True, true, yeah. And the population of Russia is what, oh, 144 million. Yeah. Right, so this is a huge number of views. This is the their biggest yet, and so there's going to be there are going to be protests this Saturday, demanding that Navalny is freed and also what the fuck is with that palace. <laughs> and so between this taping and when this is going to be become public, uh, something's going to happen. We're going to have these protests. We'll see how many people turn out. I am really hoping I am not going to be in jail or anything, but you can't really be sure. You mean because you're you're talking about this? Uh, no, I mean, but, I'm going to go to the protest and uh, you just don't know like what their strategy is these days. Power to you, man. Maybe we're, you know, we're entering the post dictator era. Um, just a couple of thoughts. First of all, uh, the, the, you know, the tastelessness of the dictator's mansion. Yeah. That's really funny. I mean, you know, this was what was said about Saddam Hussein's mm -hmm. mansions when we finally invaded uh, Baghdad and got to see how how presumably uh, he lived. And it, it seems like these are the kinds of things that, um, I don't know, uh, rock stars and uh, professional athletes who suddenly at a very, often at a very young age uh, have basically an infinite amount of money to indulge their uh, their fantasies with. And um, what re is remarkable to me is that they tend to be kind of the fantasies of, of like, uh, I don't know, a 13 year old boy, right. right? You know, yeah, man, when you're 13 years old and you're talking to your friends about what you would do if you had tons of money and, yeah, man, I'd have like a giant movie theater and I'd have a place where all these chicks can come and like do stuff for me. And, you know, just like the most garish possible things. And some some of these men actually get the opportunity to um, to do these things. I'm sure Mar-a-Lago, right. uh, you know, Trump's fantasy castle um, has a lot in common with with uh, Putin's. Um, because if you're, you know, you're king of your country, you don't have to give a shit what people think. You don't have to, uh, especially if it's a secret castle, I guess, um, you don't have to pretend to have taste. You can do exactly what you want to do. But what I don't get is that if Putin has the kind of power just to, you know, lock this guy up immediately after he, after he returns this mm -hmm. this critic of his um why doesn't he just shut down all the chatter about his mansion why doesn't he um delete that from the internet or doesn't is he kind of in this limbo where he has a lot of power but his power he's actually not a complete dictator he doesn't have the kind of absolute power that for example I don't I mean, know, like shutting down, like the video is on YouTube. Removing access to YouTube from the country, that would probably be like, of all the things he's done, that would be the most stark thing that everybody would be really pissed about because this is not just politics, right? People are watching cooking recipes. People are like, this is, um, given that the television is not, is not giving you a whole lot of quality content because it was uh, taken over by the state. And, um, you know, there's some kind of correlation. Like, that was my first beef with Putin. I remember, you know, he came in in 1999. I was, what, 11 years old. Does that make sense? Yeah. Shit, this is... 
this is, there's like this interviewer uh, on on YouTube, a Russian guy who ends up a fair uh, portion of his interviews like he talks to a guy for an hour and then he says, uh, you know, f five quick questions. And two of these questions are, how old were you in 1999? How old are you going to be in 2000, what, 20, 26, I suppose is? No, 24 is when the next election is going to be. But then Putin can do 12 more years because of the changes he, gave, he uh, put into the Constitution. So, you know, he's just asking the guests to do the math without explaining what the numbers mean. But the numbers mean most of your life is gonna is for some people already like if you were born like me you know i was 11 when putin came in i'm 32 now i've only seen two guys in power um but uh what i was trying to say oh i remember oh shutting down youtube shutting down and... te television yeah, yeah when i when yeah. i uh you know, so like a couple years down the road, I'm 13 and I'm seeing the changes to television. I was not, you know, into like, I was not seriously into politics. I would have these conversations about what the country is and the world is with my family, but you know, I'm 13. But I did have an appreciation for certain kinds of things that were shown on TV. And I could see how the medium is degrading very, very quickly because they came for, there was this like one channel that was known for its good political reporting and news and stuff. And so they had to destroy that channel completely. Uh, well, that you're, you're not only destroying the news reporters and the news people, you're destroying the whole ecosystem of uh you know, a media enterprise that has certain standards. And so you see a few iterations of that. And so with politics, humor and music and all these other things fell by the wayside as well, because you're, you know, you're destroying the whole thing. And so that was my first, like, I remember having these conversations with people where people would have arguments about whether like, well, what's your problem with Putin? I would say, Honestly, it's kind of petty, but I like good music and I can't get good music on my TV anymore. Um, so now uh, with this thing, it's one thing to like destroy a magazine or a newspaper that's not wildly read anyway. You know, this is like, it, he's done that many times. But to take away YouTube, to take away this very concrete um, way of sharing information, of getting different kinds of shit. Like, you know, people Google guides on how to hammer a nail in. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you take that away, that's going to be a very serious, very um, big step towards Soviet-like censorship in 21st century. And that would be just a hard thing to pull off. So... It it's I, I, again. Your your country always mystifies me. Um, You're not you know, alone. <laughs> Putin is is certainly one of the you know the iconic strongmen of of the world, but he doesn't. For example, you're saying he can't do the kinds of things that are done in China. You know, China has uh, the the Chinese government has absolute control over um, internet access, at least that's my understanding. And, um, you know, I have, I, I know, I have, I think, I, I guess I can say this. I have Chinese colleagues, uh, you know, still have family back in China and they couldn't come on, they, they couldn't talk about mm. China the way we're talking about Russia right now, or they would get in trouble mm -hmm. and bad things might happen to them. Bad things might happen to the people, um, who are their, their their loved ones who are still back in uh, in the country? So Putin, you know, is a bully. Um, he's a real tough guy. He certainly knows how to wield the the levers of power. But there is a kind of free press in Russia. There are still some democratic norms that are sort of nominally 
followed, I guess. So it, it's just, it's maybe what we would have in this country if Trump had been more intelligent and more competent, um, where he, and, you know, because Trump was obviously very powerful, but he couldn't win the election, and then he couldn't pull off uh, a decent coup, because he's right. just, you know, he's a numbskull when it comes down to it. He couldn't organize it. If Putin wanted to organize an insurrection, you know he would do a good job of it, but he doesn't have to. Well, I that, guess that I'm not sure of. This is, this is one of the things that um, is really interesting about this moment with you know, this movie that I just talked about, about the palace being released. And then the previous thing that Navalny did, which was very powerful too, was um, uh, other people started the investigation. He got uh, into it kind of at the end, but people investigated the assassination attempt, right? What landed him in that coma. And he released a video where they present this investigation, like we know the names of the people who did it. And that was powerful enough because the powerful thing there is they are not very competent, right? You, we have this image of Putin being on top of things and then he is a representative of, you know, KGB, then FSB, uh, the secret services, these people who are really on top of shit and you don't want to mess with them. They're, uh, you know, these James Bond type characters. And then what Navalny showed in this investigation, they're like, for example, there is one guy in this team of people who were following him for years. Uh, and he claims, you know, based on uh, this investigation is there were several uh, attempts to kill him with this poison is just uh, a couple of previous ones. The dose was so low that it didn't really do much. Um, and this last one was strong enough to land him in a, in a coma, but not to kill. Um, but uh, so he's showing, you know, he's exposing this thing that's lasted for years of them following him and uh, uh, plotting this. And there's one guy in the team, on the team, who keeps turning his phone on in the cities in the middle of this operation, you're not supposed to be turning your cell phone on because that, that can be tracked. Uh, and he's like, there's, there's like multiple times in his rendition of the stories. Like, and so then we don't know where they are, but then our good friend Alexandrov turns on his phone for just a minute and that's enough to place them here on this map. And so this is not a very competent a uh, secret service person. This is somebody who can't help but check his messages. They do a fair amount of their communication on usual phones instead of what they're supposed to be using, like these uh, protected encrypted um, phones given to them by uh, the place of their work. Uh, the best explanation, the most, um, the explanation that, that made the most sense to me that I've seen for that is they don't want to be listened by their own colleagues. Like if you're walk, talking on this FSB issued phone, this is definitely being logged by your authorities and you don't want that. And so you just try to hide from your own people and you use your own, your normal phone and that is not difficult to hack. And so there's this kind of thing, but then there's a follow-up video in which Navalny calls one of the people uh, on that team, a person who was tasked with removing the stains, the, any traces of the poison of Novichok from uh, Navalny's clothing that was left in the room, in the hotel room uh, when he was uh, taken to the hospital. Or I guess taken, uh, in the, the, the specifically they talk about his underwear, which uh, I guess was uh, taken off him in the hospital. But he calls that guy and he pretends to be an assistant to, uh, you know, a big shot. And he just goes, so we're going to do a little debriefing here. Why did the operation go wrong? What can be improved? And he talks to him uh, like 40 minutes on a phone. Navalny, like this is the person, it's, it's so weird. It's so bizarre that some people have a hard time believing it because how down can you be to not, we recognize that you're talking to Navalny, the guy who you've been 
like this is he he has a pretty recognizable voice and and way of speaking <laughs> and everything and he talks to him for 40 uh, 40 minutes and uh basically lays it all out there and at the end at the very end of the conversation the guy asks hey sorry uh can i ask you a question and when he goes sure and he says is it okay that we've been talking on like a phone this whole time and then when goes oh don't worry about it and and this is the the again the power of this piece of propaganda is that it destroys or at least it damages severely this image of the all-powerful shadowy operators who can get you so these people are not necessarily the most competent people out there listen i think uh, derision is one of the most powerful weapons against a a uh, dictator i you know there there are a bunch of people i think tolstoy uh, you know was a great pacifist toward the end of his career um and gandhi said said things along the lines of all dictators uh rely on the masses um accepting their rule because of course is if the masses reject it and um don't allow this power to be wielded wielded against them then the power kind of vanishes right. uh but this what you're talking about reminds me of the borat movie you know the recent borat movie i haven't seen um, i haven't even seen with, the original still well you've got I, i'm sure what's on youtube is the scene i'm thinking of which uh in which uh this young woman who i think is bulgarian or something like that uh in real life um who's working you know attractive young woman she's got a lot of amazing scenes in in the, the film but in this one she pretends to be um a television reporter and she wants to interview giuliani and she gets him in his mm -hmm. hotel room you've heard about this i've heard about and it. here's giuliani who you know at one time he ran for president he was a beloved mayor of new york city you know like a hero of 9 11 and all this kind of stuff and he is just revealed as this lecherous clown uh you know it's it's quite incredible and this is this is the attorney for donald trump but i i think what the problem with revealing that some of these feared powerful people are actually buffoons is that there's a there's a problem with not taking them seriously enough right because even these even buffoons can do a lot of damage sure i mean that the united states is an example of that i i feel like i mean who knows what's going to happen uh it, we're recording this a day after the inauguration and um you know it went off beautifully there was not a another uh attempt at an insurrection there was no violence around the country as some people had feared and as some of trump supporters had had promised that they would uh carry out but these these fucking assholes are still out there trump is still out there and um in spite of their clownishness they can they can still cause a lot of harm but by the way, there's a Russia connection with with the insurrection. I'm, I'm sure you probably read that there was a, a woman who, you know, they were ransacking um, the Capitol building and and a woman found a laptop that I guess belonged to Nancy Pelosi. And then she decided that she was going to try to sell it to the Russians, oh. uh, you know, make a lot of money. And um, a lot of what I've read about these people, you know, who invaded, they, they, you know, these insurrectionists or terrorists or whatever you, you want to call them, makes them sound like total idiots to me. And again, sort of people who are living out this adolescent fantasy about, um, you know, fucking with the grownups. Uh, so part of me thinks, yeah, I don't really take these people seriously, but you know they still have guns they're still capable of building bombs and and uh and of and of disrupting things and and hurting people um so i'm still i'm still a little i'm still a little worried about 
about what's going on over here. Yeah, I my my point about like the Putin's people not necessarily being the most competent people out there. You're definitely right. You don't have to be the most competent to still do damage. Uh, and Navalny is an example of that too. Like, you know, this whole story, okay, these people didn't carry out the operation perfectly. They still almost kill him. Yeah. And and he, he could have been dead if not for um, a few kind of chance um, elements there. But uh, what you're saying about the grown-ups and and the adolescent behavior of the insurrectionists, uh, that's tied to something I've been thinking about and talking about with uh, people in the last few weeks, which is uh, a view of society as a kind of a game that, uh, and, and I don't mean that um, in a way that uh, that's supposed to diminish the importance of it or the the meaning uh, of of society, but um, I, I mean a game in the same sense as children playing, you know, um, what's the word? Make believe realities. Like this is not. There's no uh, firm reality to this guy being, you know, the general of the army and this guy being um, a private. Uh, those are just like labels that these are. That's those are rules of a game. You uh, join buy into uh, a system, a narrative, and then you operate uh, within those uh, within the rules of that uh, system. So it's just the kind of fluid, intangible nature of the web of relationships that we are in in a society. But it having this game like nature uh, allows you to think through some of the things happening to the society in, in different terms. And uh, a train of thought that I've been entertaining recently is you can see um, some of these crises that, uh, well, let's pick the Western society or the America specifically for for the you know sake of the argument for to, to make it clearer, um, but you can apply it to other places, Russia, has its own situation uh, in this uh, regard. You can take, you can see these crises that the society finds themselves uh, finds itself in as a crisis of the game, a degradation of the game, as people being stuck in the game that they don't want to play anymore, uh, and they don't know how to change the game, and they don't know how to stop playing. And when you find yourself in that situation, you're, uh, you know, things start happening. So th this is, I'm a little all over the place with this metaphor, but I think it's the lens through which you can see both these uh, developments like the, whatever is happening with the whole gender part of uh, our identity and uh, relating to the world. People are, there are a lot of people who are not happy with the roles the traditional roles of a man and a woman, and they're looking for new ones, for something to replace uh, those traditional roles with. I would argue that this is, in many cases, this is not about the physical reality of being male or female, because the, the way biology defines these two roles, the masculine and the feminine within the, uh, you know, human species. That's a very, you can do a lot with being born a man. You can, you can be, there are a million ways of being a man, but then the society can narrow it down for you and say, here's how you have to be. If you're a man, here's how you have to be if you're a woman. And that can get suffocating. And then you might be looking for a way out. And like, I knew a girl, um, a girl <laughs> at the time that I met her in Houston who went through the transition. She, she was a teenager, angsty, unhappy with her life, you know, depression, uh, not feeling your own, in, in her own skin. She went, she started the transition into being a man and then did that for a while and realized that's not it either. And then detransitioned. And I met her when she was like back being a girl so that to me was an example of like you're stuck in a 
situation where you're being forced to be a certain kind of way and you don't like it. And so you're looking for a way out and you, the, the way out is not necessarily going to be better, right? You're looking for a different role. It may still suck that role because there's not a good mechanism for inventing a, role, a new role for yourself. Just like there was no good mechanism for you to make the role that you already are playing, you know, better, more fulfilling, more rich for you. And so that kind of thing is happening in many different layers of of society. I'm taking gender as an example here, but politically, it's the same kind of thing. People are looking for an ident identity, and that people are looking for a way to engage with society in a way that would be fulfilling to them. And the ways that are offered to them readily, they don't find convincing or meaningful or fulfilling. And so new options must emerge. And so some of these options are QAnon. That's a way, that's a way of reframing the whole social and political reality that does give you a different kind of role. You're going to be now uh, the rebellion the resistance against the what vampire deep pedophiles state. yeah deep state vampire pedophiles or okay. on the other side of the spectrum you have antifa who often are the same kind of you know i again when i was in houston i remember seeing some of these it just so happened that i i saw more of the left wing radicals uh and I felt about them like this is so adolescent. This is this is children playing a game. This is not people trying to do politics. It's not trying people trying to change the situation. These are people trying to find a, a subculture for themselves. You know, like the teenagers have goths and emo and or they used to have. Now it's replaced by something else. These people found Antifa. Uh, or whatever, militant radical uh, Marxism or anarchism for that crowd. And I remember thinking, like when you see pictures of some of these guys with arms, with, with weapons, uh, and talking about punching the Nazis and things like that, and, and you can clearly see that this guy doesn't know how to fight or how to shoot a rifle. He's playing that role. And so I would, for a while, I would like laugh at you know, ridicule them uh, in like private conversations. And then <laughs> this year, when the tensions in America were getting to a like boiling point, it seemed, and you saw people from the two sides, uh, this summer there was people on the right with weapons, like standing in front of stores because some other stores were looted by the other side. And the people on the right sometimes look like LARPing uh, people as well. And I had this like not very profound realization that it doesn't matter whether you're a serious person or a child playing with a gun if the gun is armed, if if, if there's the bullet in the gun. Because when you, when a person dies in the street, that it doesn't matter whether the person holding the gun was a buffoon or uh, whatever, a, a, a Vietnam vet. Yeah, um, if I could just riff on that. I, first of all, when you're talking about Antifa, uh, that reminds me, as the inauguration yesterday reminded me, that four years ago, I went down to Washington for the inauguration of Trump with, uh, with a good friend of mine, Robert. And uh, we ended up sort of inadvertently in a big pack of Antifa people who were smashing windows mm. and even fighting with cops. I think mm. I might have told you, I, I saw a girl, uh, you know, with a mask on and, and blonde ponytail coming out uh, the back, uh, knock a cop off his, um, off his motorcycle who had been chasing her. And uh, actually, I was pretty impressed with her physical prowess. <laughs> there was a guy on a there was a, this like big burly guy with a motorcycle jacket was standing right next to me who saw the girl knock the cop over and he said, eh, fuck her. And he ran out there to, uh, to beat her up presumably. And she turned around and cold cocked him. She mm. punched him right in the face and knocked him over. And then a bunch of her friends came and uh, 
pulled them away. I'm not a fan of violence on the left or the right. Um, I'm, you know, I'm ideologically more aligned with uh, Antifa and the people on the extreme left. But I think what they have in common, you're right, is that I feel like they're living out childhood fantasies of, uh, you know, violent uh, attesting of their own um, fortitude uh, in violent situations. You know, their willing, willingness to take these extreme uh, risks, which to me is, is childish. I mean, I, I see, and, and you know, I, I, I treat all forms of violence in that way. I think, I think um, violence, militarism especially, are, are these, you know, primitive human behaviors. I'm hoping one day we will become enlightened enough to uh, get past them once and for all. Just going back to what you were saying about the game of life, Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is something I've thought about a lot. It seems to me that psychedelics and meditation, you know, mystical experiences in general, can somehow elevate you from the game, you know, from all the from all the sort of busyness that we get embroiled in. Some of which gets dangerous and intense, but it's it's still a game on some level and you can rise above it, you look down on it and you feel a kind of affectionate uh, contempt for it. You realize how silly it is. Uh, but the problem, and, and I've had that feeling and I've talked to other uh, sort of old acid heads who talk about the dance of life or the game of life and you know, that's the goal of, of uh, the mystical path is to see life in that way and not take the world that seriously or you, yourself that seriously. The problem is that there's real misery and suffering in the world and there is real injustice. And as you say, there are real people with real guns and bullets who actually um, cause death and harm out there. So as much as I've been tempted in my own life to sort of pull back and see everything as kind of just absurd. You know, these silly humans, uh, look at them. They're so foolish. They take themselves so seriously. Um, but I, you know, I have to take things seriously. It's the biggest problem I have with some kinds of mysticism that they they say, uh, and I think, you know, there's some truth to this, which is what makes it powerful and insidious. They say that whatever role you're playing in life or think you're playing, it's not real. That's not real. Um, you know, all the constructions of your culture, our sex roles, whatever caste we have, happen to find ourselves in, our relationship to the structures of power in, uh, in our society, none of that is real. All right, but um, and I think there's there's some truth to that, and yet, I mean, as long as people suffer, there, it's morally irresponsible to pull back too much from the world and, and call it all a game. Well, I don't think there is there um, the meaning and importance of this thing we're calling a game. Uh, in this conversation, uh, is at odds with it being a game in, in, in that sense. I mean, like, if you go to a theater play and uh, there's, you know, the greatest actor of your time is playing Hamlet, the actor is aware he's not actually Hamlet and the audience is aware he's not actually Hamlet, but it can be a profound experience, can be moving and difficult and uh, important for all people present. The metaphor that I keep coming back to is this like childlike is, is I, I try to remember how it was, what it was like when I was five and I would spend the day outside with my friends and we would come up with games. Some, some of these games, you know, uh, fixed rules like soccer. Some of these games are, let's invent a reality for the next five hours and uh, play with it. And that kind of situation is, you know, we are all aware that we're making it up as we go along, uh, that it is a game, but 
within that game, uh, we developed friendship. We found out the character of each other. Somebody was uh, a person who will stand by you and somebody turned out to be a rat. Uh, there are different kinds of relationships that were formed or, or knowledge about the world that was eliminated or acquired in those games. Um, and And, and what I keep coming back to is if you find yourself in a game that sucks, in a, in a game that uh, causes suffering, which happened a lot at that playground, you know, some of the kids were like Trump is today. Uh, not very imaginative, but uh, it is like there, there were kids who basically would come up with games like, how about I'm going to beat you up? Is that is that a game enough, you know, playful enough for you, or you know, just a, a bully try to abuse other kids on that playground? And if you find yourself in a game that either somehow just ended up in a place like that, that uh, there are five kids playing this thing, none of them are, hype, are happy, one of them is an asshole, and others are follow, you know, following along. There are a few things that you need to always keep in mind. A, it is a game, you don't have to play it. You, you need to be able to figure out how to um, say that and, and get, get out of that game. B, you can change the game because oftentimes it is not as straightforward as this one asshole showed up and started just, you know, uh, he has a stick and he's hitting people in the head with it. Uh, sometimes it's, the game just evolved somehow to a place where it's not fun anymore. And you can either stop playing that game or you can change the rules of the game. When I'm the, these kinds of situations I'm talking about where it's imaginative play, um, you can introduce a new dynamic to the interaction. And I think it's useful to think, it is useful for me, I think, to think about these two kind of things on, on uh, different parts of the spectrum, right? There's the something simple as children's play uh, where, you know, it's made up uh, in an hour and it's played for two hours and then you do something else and it's not very sophisticated or complicated, but it still has like real suffering happens in those games. Real uh, friendships are formed. All of the richness of the human experience is there that's why playing is so important for developing uh, a child and then on the other part of the extreme you have something as complex as the human society or like the american society and in nature those things are not very different it is this like web of agreements and customs and uh, cause and consequence and you find yourself playing this role it doesn't mean that you're don't have responsibility to make sure suffering is not increased or uh, try to elevate the suffering that you encounter. It doesn't mean that that you need to look down on people around you or yourself, you know, getting so wrapped up in the game. But it is helpful to remember that this is something you can influence this is not something that is like as real as i don't know the physical the physical reality is also kind of sketchy sometimes but you know what let i mean me, yeah let me okay first of all um yesterday i played another hockey game mm -hmm. just three three people against three people this frozen lake way back in the woods at we played we started playing just as the sun went down and um and then, you know, the sun goes down, there are clouds up in the sky, and all the clouds are aflame with uh, sunlight for quite a while after the sun went down. So it's just spectacularly beautiful. Now, I'm a competitive asshole. So when I play the game, I want to win. And, um, and I get upset. Uh, so I, you know, I'm happy when I score a goal or somebody on my team scores a goal, and I'm unhappy um, when my team gets scored on. And I realized that that's absurd for me to, to have anything else but pure joy just at the game. And I feel a lot of that, but sometimes I have to stand back 
and look around me, look at my these old friends I played with for so long, look at the sky and the trees and you know the beautiful black ice that we're playing on and go, wow, this is just fucking great. I'm glad to be alive. Uh, so I'm playing this game that which involves some stress, but it's overall, it's a joyful experience in spite of the stress. Now it seems to me, one thing we could talk about if we're talking about these games, uh, the level of coercion mm -hmm. is crucial. I, I mean, you know, I grew up as sort of a privileged white kid in America. My parents had enough money to send me to nice schools and that kind of thing. So, man, I won the lottery. And, uh, and that's just, it's just unfair, you know, because there's so many people who don't have the options in playing the game that I do. So, you know, we're in this ever lasting process of trying to rewrite the, the rules so that people aren't coerced into playing some roles that aren't fun, right? Um, Marx had this uh, wonderful phrase, I think this was in a letter, where he's talking about you know, the end goal of communism. Mm -hmm. And it's a stateless society where everybody is really free to be whatever they want to be. And he's got this extraordinary phrase where he says something like, uh, you know, you could be a farmer in the morning and a fisherman in the afternoon. And uh, I think he says a critic. I don't know what that is a translation of. Literary critic. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess meaning an intellectual in the right. evening. So in other words, he's saying um, in his dream society, none of us gets locked into a, 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 uh, a particular role in this game. We can switch around um, as we choose from one role to another. So it's kind of this, this view of human identity as something that is um, very fluid with infinite degrees of freedom and I, I don't, and, and no coercion, right? And you're not worried about, presumably about money uh, about you know your physical security and, and uh, things like that. Whether or not, I actually wrote about this at the end of um, uh, Mind Body Problems in this, this chapter on this wonderful economist, Deirdre McCloskey, who switched from being a man to a woman in her, um, in her 50s. And it, it, thinking about her life gave me this vision of, of uh, a possible society where this is where we're just free to be exactly not who we really are because that's too static i mean i don't know what i am well, we still don't really know what that is yeah yeah but you have the freedom to play all these different roles and then it really does become like a game or it becomes like a play um and you know there, there still will be pain and and happiness all you know the full range of of human emotions but um but i think you know again in this fantasy uh not the not the brutality and cruelty and absolute unfairness and lack of freedom that so many people experience in the world today uh i, I want to throw two things in one is uh, it seemed like right now when you were talking about the levels of coercion and uh, privilege and stuff like that, you did I get it right? You're talking mo mostly about uh, like economic realities or, uh, you know, you are born in a rough place where there's war and stuff like that, like very concrete levels of violence and suffering or a lack of opportunity. Absolutely, which is tied to race and gender and caste and and you know religious affiliation and all these other sorts of things uh what i want to add to that is even if you sort all of that out and you just have your relationships to deal with there's still going to be the social realities that can that can have a lot of suffering and confusion and anxiety to be like i know people of my own 
uh, class or richer than me, having more opportunities in terms of economy uh, and, uh, you know, being able to move to a different place, etc. But who are less happy than I am um, because I have good friends and they couldn't find uh, or couldn't establish these kinds of relationships, right? Or I'm in a good romantic relationship and they are in... Uh, a very confused web of relationships, none of which are uh, is fulfilling, right? So that is not. I I think a lot of, a lot of um, social realities, even the kinds of which you were talking about, like within the society, uh, some people have more opportunities, some less. That comes as a consequence of. if your mother or father is a troubled person or an asshole or uh, they are in a bad relationship, that's going to have profound effects on you. That is going to, you know, you being formed by that reality is going to have consequences to people around you and, uh, you know, and so forth. So it's not, it's not as easy as, I mean, that, not that that's easy, but even if we did solve all of these material issues and you imagine the society where you, everybody has basic income and you don't have to strive so much and uh, just be what you want to be, that's not going to be easy. You have a, a, just like, again, you put a bunch of kids on a playground and they don't have to worry about food. They don't have to worry about uh, work. They're five, but some of them, are closer to being an asshole than others. And the social interaction that's going to be established at that playground is not going to be without suffering, most likely. Oh, hell yeah. Here, here's, I mean, I wrote about this in Rational Mysticism. Buddhism, it seems to me, and a lot of the sort of mystical paths in general are, are, are these methods for supposedly avoiding heartbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think Buddha correctly diagnosed uh, desire and attachment as two of the main impediments to a, a kind of sustained happiness, right? To be to being sort of permanently in the state that I was trying to be in, when I looked up from the hockey game, and I'm looking at, you know, the the beautiful uh, pink clouds against a blue sky after the sun has gone down, where you're going, wow, it's great to be alive, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the greatest source of pain, I think, for a lot of people, uh, especially if you, you know, put aside economic injustice and, and racism and, and uh, war and all that stuff. Let's say we have utopia. Um, you can still fall in love with somebody who doesn't fall, who doesn't love you, yeah. or you both, you're both in love, and then you know, the thrill is gone, and your beloved doesn't want to be with you anymore, and it's like a blow. It's that could be a mortal blow, and it's really, that is a pain, that I think is eternal, and I think it's. I think it's wrong of Buddhism to try to make us immune to that. I think if we become immune to heartbreak, then we're not really human anymore. It seems to me that one of the, the best uh, parts of human nature is our attachment to other people, you know, our love of the world. And the other people in the world can disappoint us, even in utopia. And uh, and then we're, you know, we're we're so we're so melancholy that we contemplate taking our own lives or we do take our own lives. Um, so yeah, I've seen people with everything, uh, you know, every possible material advantage. Uh, who, I'm thinking of Putin now and wondering if he's happy. He seems happy. I mean, so, <laughs> so it, it, he's good at faking it if he's not. And I, you know, I'm assuming people talk about the happiness of Donald Trump. You know, he he gets frustrated and enraged, but uh, Donald Trump doesn't have some of these kinds of mortal wounds to himself that I think 
ordinary people who care about others have. You know, he's a raging narcissist, mm. and um, and I think it's you know the the one of the cruel jokes of existence is that some raging narcissists can have quite happy lives, you know, dishing out cruelty to others and not giving a damn about it. Uh, and one thing that you can never take away from Trump is that he became president of the United States. Yeah. You know, he was the most powerful man in, in the world for four years, right? So, you know, that's over, but uh, he was still there. But I, I guess I'm trying to agree with you that the human condition always will be, uh, you know, it will have its share of sorrow uh, unless we try to design that out of ourselves. You know, we go beyond Buddhism and have techno enhancements to right. ourselves. We right. tweak our genes or have brain implants that allow us to experience just, you know, different gradations of mystical bliss instead of the full range from bliss to heartbreak, to crushing despair. Uh, which I think I, I, I think and expect will and should be our, our fate for as long as we exist. I've, I've been in, uh, what do you call those, states of consciousness um, where there's nothing but, like I'm thinking about a particular DMT trip where I found out, I guess the trip before that, that you can change the contents of the trip by... Um, applying a certain kind of effort and sound and movement and shit. And so I was experimenting with it. And uh, I spent a lot of it mixing all of these different shades of experience, humor, sex, power, uh, whatever. You just like uh, adding things and, and, and uh, going from one kind of like call it energy to another. And at one point I got what it felt like the, the, the point of attention, the focal point in the body was getting up to the head or higher than that. And that was when that happened, the contents of the trip changed to just very calm uh, bliss and clarity and uh, how you would imagine, I don't know, the one of the one of the takes on the ultimate reality or whatever and it was very nice there for a little while and then i thought i'm gonna go back this is this is good but there was some interesting shit happening on those other la layers and uh it, it just came to mind as you were talking about it. there's i mean Sorrow and pain, uh, not something that I seek, but not something that I see as meaningless in my own life. Um, the other thing, two more things I want to throw in. One about QAnon and with another is just a short comment. I've done a few conversations here on this channel about Scientology. And um, one of the uh, tenant is probably a, a too big of a word, but like, topics that keep coming up in their weird little reality is that since you are not really who you think you are, you're not a human, you're not, uh, uh, you know, your name, your status, your your family relationship, etc. You are this eternal being, Satan, that's gone through incarnations, etc. Et so like with, this is a premise of many a religion, right? Uh, there's an essence of you that's that has nothing to do with this little role you're playing in this lifetime. Scientologists from that um, conclude that you should be free of all of this bullshit. You, you, it doesn't matter. Your family relationships don't matter. Your all of this stuff doesn't matter because it's not who you are. You need to find out who you are and then build your life out of that on, on that premise. And somebody commented. Uh, on one of these conversations that I had about Scientology with a critic of Scientology, Tony Ortega, somebody commented saying, I think the guy was from India. Uh, and he said, this is a part of Hinduism too. That is all a game. These roles are not what you are, but the crucial difference is to not play your role in Hinduism is 
like an actor who can't play his role. That's not, uh, you haven't succeeded at anything. You were supposed to play Hamlet and there's sorrow and heartache there. You were supposed to experience that because that's the beauty of the whole enterprise. That's why people gathered here. And if Hamlet in the middle of the play goes, fuck this, I don't want to play this. And, uh, you know, starts starts trying to impose some kind of other reality on that. I guess that's what contemporary theater is sometimes <laughs> these days. But that's like, that goes against the metaphor of the game as seen as, as seen in, in Hinduism. There's a scene in uh, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the great Hindu text that, that I remember as you were speaking, where there's um, Arjuna is one of the protagonists. As I recall, he's a, he's a sort of a warrior prince and uh, he's involved in this in this great war, I think against another family member. And I pardon if I'm mangling this. Uh, and uh, and Krishna is the you know the God, the the voice of of uh, mystical wisdom, who's embodied as uh, as another warrior. And Arjuna doesn't want to fight this war. And um, and Krishna has this conversation with Arjuna in which she basically says, yeah, this, this is a game. It's a stupid game um, in some ways. There is sort of needless suffering, but this is your role mm -hmm. and, uh, and you have to play it. This is your fate. So it's this weird combination of this kind of transcendent mystical perspective where you just see you know, this endless circle of human striving and failure and, you know, the, the, the great wheel of, uh, of birth and, and, uh, and death and, and rebirth, uh, and from which we are supposed to be liberated at some point. But Krishna is saying, at least in my reading, you still have to play the role that, that life dealt you. Um, which seems like a contradiction to me. And I never liked that passage, especially because it seems to justify warfare. And I, you know, I think that some aspects of the great wheel of birth and rebirth uh, should be deleted. You know, mm -hmm. we should get past that. Uh, and it seems to me, even if we do, so it, I, you know, I, I the, the, there's a tension, I think, between progressivism, the belief that we can have increasing social justice and more freedom to be who we want to be. And this kind of eternal mystical perspective that sees all our human strivings, even the striving for human, uh, for social justice as kind of um, absurd or not real in some sense. And I'm gonna lean toward the side of taking the quest for social justice taking progressivism uh, seriously, even though I'm, you know, because I've taken massive amounts of LSD, I'm very sympathetic toward the, uh, the mystical, nothing really matters, everything passes point of view. Well, again, I don't think that tension is necessarily, uh, I don't think there's a paradox here because I keep coming back to this metaphor of children playing as an, adult or even as a child even in the midst of, of the game you can remember that this is a game but if part of the game is like you punching a different kid that pain is real right so it, it it doesn't have to be real to matter right and so my conclusion out of this like that the whole framework of you know we, we keep using this or i keep using this term game the conclusion that I get from uh, this train of thought is whether it is possible or whether we want this liberation from the game that you're speaking with uh, of the, the mystical uh, way of interpreting it, um, I, I don't know if I want to go there or is, is, if that's the goal, but in order to make the game better, it's helpful to remember that it is a game and so it can be changed, a different game can be put in its place, et cetera. And so the social realities that we inhabit, um, it, 
the kind of like open question that I pose for myself is what is the what are the rules of the evolution of those games? I think these these are questions that I don't know if you're like a, a somebody who studied law in the university, you're supposed to be thinking not only about the let's say what the American Constitution says and how to in interpret those laws, but also to think about the evolution of law. Why is it the case that 2000 years ago at this locality, there were these rules and now we have these rules, how we get from this place to that place? How are the laws we're uh, taking seriously now gonna change? What are the laws for changing laws, uh, et cetera? And so with the same kind of framework, you, with the same kind of um, way of approaching the situation, you can be thinking about society generally. Uh, let's say it's a game. How do games change? How do they evolve? How do some games degrade to simple violence and chaos? Uh, how do games evolve into being even richer and having even more dimensions than they have now? And so how do you make sure that the game you're playing, your society, is the one that can be better, that is improving itself and, and is becoming more interesting and fulfilling. And the things that I keep uh, coming back to are remembering that you don't have to play, right? And and sometimes there is coercion of, of the level that it's hard to stop playing even if you think you don't want to play but but it starts with realizing this is a game i don't need to play it right and then you figure out how to get out of it and the other thing is these kinds of games these may believe the realities um ch are changeable this is if the rules suck you can introduce something again i'm thinking back to like when i was five it sometimes was the case they've been playing a game and it's gotten boring. It's not even that violence has erupted, but it's just not fun. And it took, you can, you can do that still. You can like spend an hour that hour playing the boring game that nobody's enjoying anymore until somebody remembers, I can actually just like make up a new dimension to this. And then it'll get, it's going to be interesting again, like it was three hours ago. So those two elements, I think, are very important to like keep in mind and in in your like being, like uh, act out the these two um, notions. So, um, all right, I, I just wanted to let you know that I'm I'm I think we've already been talking for more than an hour, and I I, I can't talk much longer. And you haven't even told me about Glossalia yeah. yet. So I think we're gonna have to wait until our next conversation because i really i really want to hear about that i'll tease that for the audience i spent about half an hour for the first time in my life i spent about half an hour speaking in a nonsensical language to myself and it was a very illuminating experience i i know a mushrooms science writer, were involved i know a british science writer who um uh used to be an evangelical christian and had the experience of speaking in uh right. tongues or whatever i, I forget what, what it's it, called yeah yeah uh, but anyway, what I was going to say in reaction to your uh, to your last riff, it's one of the questions that interests me here is, like, let's say we take seriously the idea that you know some people in AI uh, have had for decades that um, machines are going to become autonomous and super intelligent, and and they're going to quickly take over the earth. They're maybe maybe going to put us in zoos where we can do our own human thing. But the machines are going to be the you know the serious players on Earth and then beyond the Earth. Um, so what will the machines be like? These super intelligent, possibly immortal uh, things. What will drive them? What will be their their nature? And what's always struck me about science fiction and even the writings of various serious um, AI theorists, you know, people who are into the singularity and that kind of stuff, is that they just assume that competition will be part of the game. That mm. as the game has continued to be played, there will be competition, uh, you know, war, uh, battles uh, for supremacy, for power. And it always struck me that that is just such an obvious uh, projection of 
of our own um, human nature on these super intelligent machines. Why, why, I mean, maybe we need competition for life to be interesting, uh, but it seems to me that, that the super intelligent machines should be able to design the competition to maximize the fun and minimize the pain so that it is kind of like me playing hockey with my friends, right? So we, we you know, yeah, I want to win. I don't like to lose, but I love to play no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I'm feeling this brotherhood, you know, with the other, uh, with the other players. Um, and, you know, we're all in this together and we're all glad to be alive, but maybe the machines will have that, that they'll have competition just as a kind of, uh, a structure, um, for their existence that makes it more dramatic and fun, but isn't the ridiculous kind of competition that we have now where it's a zero sum game and there are winners, you know, for every person who wins, somebody else has, has, uh, has lost. And I, I think it's possible for humans, even if we don't become super intelligent. That, that's, that's always my thought about, uh, you know, these AI um, ideas is like, I mean, we already have the situation that you're envisioning. What would it be if there was a conscious thing that we created and then uh, we already have this conscious thing that's in in this you know process of, of figuring out what it like we, it's going to be another layer layer of what has been happening on this planet right and so it seems to make sense to me that in order to envision or uh create a reality, this artificial reality with machines at the, as the central characters, it would help to try to figure out what is happening already here in this reality that we've been studying for quite some time and still haven't figured out. It's going to be more of this. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, uh, there, there's so much... I would like to see before I die, while I'm still capable of even noticing what's going on in the world, the beginning of a world where we are, where one of our problems is boredom or lack of drama, you know, because some of our, because some of our really serious problems have been solved. Uh, and, uh, and to see how we how we deal with that existential crisis crisis that you know the crisis of of recognizing that wow life really is intrinsically meaningless and once you know once everything is is made fair and pretty good then we still face this void that we have to fill and so what are we going to do with that but uh, don't you think i, I know you're, you 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 need to go soon but just a quick follow up don't you think that some of the things we're seeing like some of the people storming that capitol building uh are not uh, economically deprived and like so, some of the some of the drama drama that's created as we speak today politically um and even uh, straight up violence some of these Nazis and Antifa people on the two sides haven't had a whole lot of problems of the kinds you're speaking of, like, uh, you know, having to deal with violence and not being able to put food on the table. And in some cases, the reason they're in that uh, skirmish is they want some drama or there's, there's, Maybe not one, but you, you know, like like the the, the complexities of human um, psychology. You people sometimes end up in abusive relationships, uh, one after another after another. Not because they want that; that would be a wrong word to choose. But there's a pattern in your psyche that leads you to those situations. And um, don't you think that some of the drama that we're seeing now politically comes out of the fact that there is not 
a lot of um, straightforward drama of like having to hunt an animal to eat tomorrow? I fear that you're right. Um, you know, so back in the early 90s, there was this book, The End of History, by Francis Fukuyama, who I think is, I think Bob has talked to him on, on uh, Bob Wright has talked to him on Bargain Heads TV. And, um, you know, by end of history, he meant the end of the search for an optimal social organization. And it, you know, it was between uh, Soviet style communism or socialism and uh, American style democracy plus capitalism. And Fukuyama said, this is shortly after, you know, the Berlin Wall came down. Well, you know, we won, American way has won. Uh, so yay for us. And then at the end of his book, he says that he, he quotes a lot of Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, he fears that we won't, you know, we're sort of in paradise and that we won't be happy with it uh, because what we really need is, um, you know, we need to be tested and we need to be, uh, to earn respect. And, uh, and so this kind of bland consumerism and freedom that, that America has given us won't be enough for us. And so we might create conflicts and wars basically to give ourselves something to do right so i think that's kind of what you're saying here and um i'm hoping that this is just like a like a, a stage of growing up uh that we'll have some backsliding as we cruise towards utopia <laughs> uh and we might start you know some people won't want to grow up and uh they'll, they'll start They'll join QAnon or the Proud Boys and do these ridiculous things. Um, or SDS, you know, the weathermen while right. I was growing up. Right. But, uh, or even, you know, I'll say Antifa, you know, the violent wing of Antifa I see as, as kind of uh, foolish and manufacturing drama. Uh, so, yeah, that happens. I'm just hoping it's not going to prevent us from getting to where we need to go. Okay, conversation to be continued. <laughs> Next time we're going to figure out where we need to go. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm up for it. And you're going to talk about glossalia. Yeah, I think it, is that how you pronounce that word? I thought it was glossalalia. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you're right. Yeah, but in any in making weird noises is what that is. Yeah, I, I had that problem with, uh, what was it called? I think the word is tinnitus. And I always thought, I always said it as tintinitis because I, I don't know, for some reason, I thought that was more evocative. I don't know what that word said. is. Uh, my, my English uh, knowledge is limited. Tinnitus, what is that? Uh, it's like a ringing in your ears. Mm, okay. Or, or I think it's actually pronounced tinnitus. <laughs> However I pronounce it, I know it's always wrong. Tinnitus. But it's, yeah, it's basically sound in your ear that has no external source. That's a just that's an interesting definition. You can you can get get a lot of that uh, out of that. Uh, yes, you can you can you can form a mystical worldview uh, with that thing at the center of it. Yeah. All right. Hearing something that's not there. Yep. Okay, man. Talk. To I'll you talk to you in a couple of weeks. Two weeks. Okay.